Hello everyone and welcome back. So this time we're going to have to calculate where the shear center is. And it's not super easy, but it's not super hard either. So we want to find the shear center for this particular section. Um, and also, the distribution of shear stresses created by a shear force of 30 kilonewtons. So where's the shear center? And what do the shear stresses look like that are caused by that shear force? Okay. Now this is not what I'm going to make you do on your own. If you can, if you want to, go ahead and try it. But it's one of those things I think will be a lot easier if you see it done once. So let's try that out. Let's do it together. Okay. So first off, we're going to need to know the moment of inertia about the neutral axis. Luckily our neutral axis, it's symmetric in the y direction, so we don't have to do anything there. But now we need our moment of inertia. And this is simply breaking apart all of our pieces here. Okay. All of our pieces to get that moment of inertia. I'll let you look at this. You can check it if you want to, um, but I'm not going to focus on this now. Just take me at face value. The moment of inertia is correct because it'll be one million one hundred thirty-four thousand millimeters to the fourth. Okay. Now to the little bit harder part. We have to figure out what the shear flow is in all these different points. So first off, we're going to be in the upper stiffener. That's right there. We gotta find the shear flow, or sorry, the um, shear flow for that point. So we need a value for the first moment of area of that point. Now, the thing you're probably wondering is why in the world am I calculating this? Why am I calculating this? Well, it's because we're trying to find the force, okay? And yes, yes, I could just say, you know, um, look at some particular point and say, what's the force or what's the stress at that point? That works. Um, but the big issue we run into is this. The force that is developed in this section is going to be based on the integral of the shear flow over that section. Because if you look at Q, the shear flow, it's like newtons per millimeter. So when I'm integrating that, you know, with some like dx, that turns into newtons. And this changes. It's going to increase as we go there. So I can't just say, oh, well, I'm just going to take this one area um, and just get my Q. Now I've got to make sure that I get the full effect from how the shear flow is changing. Okay, so I set up my equations. This is my first moment of area, which takes into account, well, wherever I am, that is going to be um, the centroid right here. And then the area is going to be this right here. Multiply out and I get that value. So now that I've done that, I plug everything in there. So I have my shear force, which I don't have a value for that yet. That's okay. You don't need a value for it to start because it actually, when it comes to calculating the shear center, it all cancels out. So I have this equation and now I have to integrate with respect to that temporary variable V right here. So I integrate and what I get is, oh, just jumping ahead, sorry. integrate from zero to 30 millimeters. So that'll be from all the way up that little section for that part. It'll come out to be 0 0.238095 times the shear force. And as a note, guess what? These two are identical. So I only need to calculate one of them. Okay. Now the second section is going to be going along here. I now, if you're thinking about first moment of area, I still have to include all of this, but you know, now that I've got the whole thing, it's not going to be changing anymore. I can just keep it as a full number, just the area times the distance to the centroid. But this one, this one's going to be changing as we move across the bar. So that one we're going to have to do it with um, right equation for. So the biggest thing is you can easily write an equation for the first moment area of this little section. Just draw out, give it a width or height or length of u, and then write out the equation for first moment of area. It's the area, which is going to be u times five millimeter times the distance from that to the centroid. So that's all you have to do. And you get it fairly simply. So I do that um, and I get my area, which is this right here, plus the distance to the centroid of that area which is 40 millimeters. 
and then I add on to that the first moment of area from the first section. So that's my shear flow now as a function of all that. And then I have to integrate. So I integrate. The integrals are never too terrible in this uh, as long as you're careful. And what I will get in the end is that it's going to be equal to 0 0.3758 times the shear force. That'd be the same for the top and the bottom. So I've done one of those sides. So those two and those two are now done. I just need to do this one. And honestly, to calculate the shear center, I don't even need to do this one. That one right there I could completely skip out on if I wanted to. But we're not going to do that because we're going to need it for other things later. Okay. So let's find the shear flow in the web. Now, just what we talked about last time, this area gets this first moment area gets added on. This one gets added on, and neither of those change anymore. So the only thing that's going to change is this, but we still have to include those values. So around my equation for the first moment of area, these are for the first two sections. And now I'm doing this vertical section. So I get my nice equation for it. And then if I want to, I can go ahead and plug that in to get an equation for the shear flow in the web. So this is my shear flow in the web. This is how it changes as I go down. And then all I have to do is integrate this. But as I said before, like to calculate the shear center, you wouldn't actually need this because we could have just taken our moment around this point, which makes sense because the eccentricity is always coming from this point, at least in this case. So. And this one would have a magnitude of 1.047 times the shear force. That would be the force developed inside of that flange. Okay, so now we know all of the forces and we're trying to find the shear center. So all of these are going to cause a torque. And I can choose any point I want, but I'm going to do it around this point because that's where my eccentricity is measured from. So they're going to cause a torque around that. You can see that this is turning it that way. Same, same. Same, they're all causing it to spin in this direction. So I need to cancel that out. And I do that by applying my force over here. And I have to make sure it's far enough away that all those internal shear forces, sorry, those internal forces are going to be canceled out. So it's not too terrible right there. It's just our sum of moments. And we will get that the force in the flange. That's not too terrible to calculate there. It's simply that our, um, so the moment is going to be equal to zero and therefore the force in the flange um, plus two times the force in the stiffener it's going to be necessary to figure that out. So I calculate it and I get that my distance will need to be 32.7 millimeters. 32.7 millimeters. Okay. Whew. We've done a lot here. Now, as for the shear stress distribution, I'm not going to go back and calculate everything. We had an equation for Q for everywhere, and that is equivalent to my shear stress. Like that is proportional to it, just got to multiply by the thickness. Or sorry, um, well, it depends on what units I want. Um, so, go back and see if you can now calculate all these points. Now, if you wonder like why there's A, B, B, C, C, D, all that kind of stuff, it's simply because we're saying that you know, one part is the stiffener, but on the other side of that point is now the flange. And we're having to keep that in mind. But thank you for listening. I hope this helps you, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.